today, we're talking about binging with the author of Never Binge Again. His name is Glenn Livingston, PhD. He's a veteran psychologist and longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. So he's got a background with big food. So he's going to talk about the things that he learned there and his psychology background went through his own journey of binge eating, being overweight, and really, really for his own personal journey, went to the depths of like, what is going on here? So they went on this big, like emotional healing, psychologist, self-love journey. And then he talks about something else, a different approach that he found that he's going to share with you guys in the show that I think you'll find really interesting. Um, you can find the book at neverbingeagain.com. Um, you can actually get a PDF download of the book for free there. So check that out, neverbingeagain.com. And wow, we go and get into some really cool stuff here. He's very refreshing, keeps it really real. Here is Glenn Livingston. Okay. So Dr. Livingston, what I love about your message is how you got to it. You have your background in psychology. You have a background in business and working with big food, big pharma, and then you have your own personal journey that bring us all here. And so could you share with the audience how you got to this point about teaching people how to never binge again? I, I sure will if you'll call me Glenn, because it's going to be a long <laughs> half hour if you keep saying Dr. <laughs> um, Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So what, when I was about 16 or 17, I, um, I had a serious eating problem. It didn't seem like a problem at the time, but I figured out that if I worked out for a couple hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to. Um, boxes of boxes of muffins, whole pizzas, you know, six lattes, six chocolate bars, didn't matter, whatever I wanted to. And it was great. I thought it was great. Um, I was relatively tall and thin and, um, you know, and muscular and it, it was a great thing. But as I got older, when I was, I got married at 22 and went to graduate school and suddenly I was commuting two hours each way to take classes and see patients. And then I get home at night and my wife at the time, I'm, I'm divorced now, but she, she would want, um, she want me to talk to her <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would be helping her with the business a little too. Um, and I just didn't have the time to work out, but I found that food still had a real hold on me. Um, I didn't gain a lot of weight at first. There, there was a time I got up to about 300 pounds. I'll tell you how that happened. I think I stopped weighing myself at 257. Um, but, but what really bothered me was my inability to feel present. Um, you know, I come from a family of 17 therapists and something breaks in the household. Everybody asks it how it feels and nobody knows how to fix it. And, um, I'm only half joking. Being a psychologist has always been the most important thing to me, but you can't be a really great psychologist if you can't be present. It's not really about intellectually putting together the jigsaw puzzle of people's lives. It's, it's more about getting people to love and trust you enough that they're willing to think new thoughts and try new things and leave their comfort zone. And, and I couldn't be present. I just couldn't be present to do that. Not totally anyway. Um, I'd be sitting with a suicidal person and thinking, when can I get the next pizza? You know, um, I never lost anybody. Thank God I compensated in other ways, but um, it was bad. It was mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. um, coming from the family that I came from, I thought this was a deeply psychological problem that would have a deeply psychological solution. So I went to the best therapist. I went to a psychiatrist. I took medication for a little while. I went to Overeaters Anonymous. I went on a spiritual journey. Um, anything you could imagine, I would try over the course of many, many years. And no matter what approach I tried, I would get a little thinner and a bunch fatter, a little thinner and a bunch fatter. And the food obsession just kept on growing. I just kept on thinking about food all the time. Um, over the course of about 20 years, I eventually changed the paradigm from a love your inner wounded child, you know, heal the hole in your heart so you don't have to fill the hole in your stomach mm -hmm. kind of approach to a uh, take no prisoners, alpha dog of my own mind approach. And there were three things that facilitated that transition. What, one was that because I, you know, I didn't commute, my wife of 28 years traveled for business. So I had a lot of time on my hands. We'd never had kids. Um, and I had time for a second career. So I started consulting in the business and then kind of had my own 
branch of the business eventually became the CEO. And what we did was advertising research for big food and big pharma. And I feel guilty about it. <laughs> um, no, I do. I, I was on the wrong but side it, of the. It was so part of your purpose. It was so needed. Okay, keep going. <laughs> it was. It was. Well, I mean, and I mean the way the way it turned out. Because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. I was consulting for a lot for big food, and I was, you know, kind of like the Marlboro man. I was on the wrong side of the war, um, selling sugar to kids and things like that. And um, what I saw while I was there, though, was just how powerful. The, the amount of money and all the rocket scientists that were hired to engineer these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and excitotoxins and salt. Um, and it's all engineered to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain, the very primitive part of our brain, without giving enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And the result of that has nothing to do with our personal psychology. It's a physiological um, pressing of our evolutionary buttons that says, you know, just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. And, and every time you're looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container, there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache that's laughing all the way to the bank. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm exaggerating for effect, but it's not really an exaggeration. It's yeah. um, um, they, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. There, there were chemicals that could put into the products that would turn off the sensors in your small intestines that could tell when you were full. Wow. Um, the advertising industry, I remember a VP in the advertising industry said to me as he was leaving the company, because we, we'd become kind of friendly, he said, um, hey, Glenn, the most profitable thing we ever did was to take the vitamins out of the bar and put it into the packaging instead. And then they made the packaging look multicolored, vibrant, and diverse because in nature, excuse me, a multicolored, diverse patch of vegetables or, or fruits would be providing you with a multitude of micronutrients, a diversity of micronutrients. Right. And so we've developed this variety instinct to go after, you know, that those vibrant colors, eat the rainbow, red, red tomatoes, blueberries, green lettuce, you know, yellow peppers. We, we want a salad that's filled with diversity of micronutrients, but here what they were doing was they were acting like predators. They, they were faking out that evolutionary instinct and getting us to go for their bars and said, they took the vitamins out of it. Not um, me over here at all feeling anger and rage bubble up inside of me. And I'm like, let it go, let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Just doing minds at work as I listen. <laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is I don't really know if they were evil people, um, you know, we, we live, yeah. we live in a capitalist society and the consumer, the consumer doesn't necessarily want healthy food. What they want is plausible deniability. They, they want to be able to say those potato chips are made with avocado oil and vitamin E, therefore they're healthy for me. Mm-hmm. Ignoring the fact that there's almost no nutrition in a potato chip, ignoring the fact that any type of study with heated oil will show carcin- carcinogenicity, nor in the fact that, you know, even the baking of the potatoes can create acrylamides. I mean, I, I think potato chips can be a lovely thing if you really want to include them in your diet. And I don't, I don't preach abstinence for most people. Some people need to. Um, but I think that when you, there's a difference between thinking that something is less bad for you and thinking that it's good for you. If you think, think something is less bad for you uh, if you think it's good for you, you're likely to have a lot more and get into yourself in a lot more trouble. If you recognize that it's an indulgence and you're not really doing the best thing for yourself, like like taking a drink or something like that, mm-hmm. um, then okay, you know we fought wars mm-hmm. for our freedom and let's uh, let's indulge here and there if we really want to. But um, mm-hmm. don't don't tell me it's healthy for me. Don't tell me it's healthy for me. Right. So, but here's the thing: is that I I saw that there was this external force that was stimulating something in my reptilian brain. Then I started looking into like what's what other functions just as a reptilian man really have. And the interesting thing that I learned is it's not really much about love because I've been trying to love myself then for 20 years. But when the reptilian brain assesses something in the environment, it's more like a bad college drinking game. It says, mm-hmm. do, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? Mm-hmm. Eat, mate, or kill, right? It's not until the mammalian brain came onto the scene and, you know, kind of evolved on top of it to 
inhibit the impulse and say, wait a minute, before you eat meat or kill that thing, what impact does that have on my tribe and the people that I love? And then there's a neocortex that says, what impact will it have on my long-term goals, on the kind of person I'm trying to be in society, on my music, my art, my spirituality, my long, my, um, mm -hmm. my strategies and, and you know, uh, machinations in, in society. Um, but this, this thing at the bottom was emergency response, eat, made, or kill, keep me alive at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. So I started saying, okay, well, maybe what's happening is that this reptilian thing, this thing in my brainstem is getting artificially stimulated. And I developed a pattern because you can, there are grooves in the brain that form where we're learning machines. And I, devel I developed a pattern of automaticity so mm -hmm. that it was stimulated. I would go to chocolate was my thing usually to start with. And then I go to pizza and then I go to mm -hmm. God knows what else. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I actually had to do one more study before I came to my senses and changed to more of an alpha dog approach. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did this, I was getting paid a lot of money to do market research and how to do market research. So in the days when the internet click, clicks were cheap, like around 1998 or so, I set up a five-year study online mm -hmm. where I just left this survey running. I would intercept people when they're searching for stress management. And I'd ask them, what are you stressed about? What foods can't you stop eating? And I would see some patterns and they were very interesting. Mm -hmm. And at the time I thought I found something profound. It turned out that it really didn't mean much. It was, but it led me to the eventual solution mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I found that people who struggled with chocolate when they were stressed tended to be lonely or brokenhearted or a little depressed. And that, that described me actually, because I wasn't that happy in the marriage and everything. Mm -hmm. People who struggled with um, soft, chewy things like pasta and bread and pizza and bagels, they tended to be stressed at home. And people who wanted crunchy, salty things, they, they tended to be stressed at work. Hmm. And it was fascinating. It made for mm -hmm. you know good pu publicity conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but before I went out and taught it, I really did anything with it. I was really trying to figure it out for myself. Yeah. So, and I'd forgotten about it for a while. Honestly, I took it offline. I'd forgotten about it for a while. So rolling around to about 2007 or so, I'm 40 two, something like that. And um, along the way, I had ballooned up to almost 300 pounds. I came down a little bit, but um, I, I, I called my um, mom to try to understand a little bit more about these patterns. I was looking at the study and I did this Skype call with my mom. And I said, mom, this is really interesting because I know you're more addicted to chocolate than I am. And what happened to us? You happened to have raised us people who are addicted to chocolate, they feel lonely, you know, a little depressed, brokenhearted, they run the chocolate. First of all, do you resonate with that? She says, oh, yes. And I said, well, what happened? And she gets this horrible look on her face, like, and, and like the sound of shame in her voice. Mm -hmm. And I said, mom, it's okay. It was 40 years ago, whatever happened, I love you. It's okay. I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, my mom's really cool. And, <laughs> and um, she said, well, honey, when you were one year old in 1965, your father, my husband, was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam and I was terrified. I thought I was gonna be an army widow. We were trying to get pregnant with your sister. I was gonna have two little kids. I was terrified. At the same time, my father, your grandfather, had just gotten out of prison and I had idolized him my whole life. We didn't know where he was for two years and it turned out he was guilty. He was doing these things. And so I was horribly depressed. So here I am, horribly depressed and anxious. I've got this little one-year-old, the middle of the 60s, and um, I don't have the wherewithal to hold you and love you and play with you and cuddle you and all yeah. the things that a one-year-old really wants. So what I did was I got a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup, and I put it in the refrigerator on the floor. Wow. And when you came running to me, I'd say, go get your Bosco, honey. Mm -hmm. And you go running over to the um to the refrigerator, crawling over to the refrigerator and you'd suck on the bottle and you go into a chocolate sugar coma, right? Wow. And it seems like a eureka moment. It seems like a movie moment, right? And, <laughs> and if, if it were a movie, at that point, mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry. This is over Skype. We, we, <laughs> we, we'd, we'd have a big hug and we'd have a big cry and then I'd never have trouble with chocolate again, right? Because eureka, I found it. This is what yeah. happened. 
right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have to repress the trauma. I can have a good cry about it. I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of sort of had a metaphorical hug and a cry. And it was a really good conversation to have because I learned a lot about her. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a lot of compassion for myself after that. I didn't hate mm -hmm. myself as much. I wasn't as disgusted, even though I was still fat. I, I didn't hate myself as much. Mm -hmm. um, however, it didn't help me with the chocolate. As a matter of fact, it made it worse. Mm -hmm. And the reason it got worse was that there was suddenly this voice inside. I'm not schizophrenic. It's just mm -hmm. like a voice, voice of justification. And it, it would say, hey, Glenn, you know what? Our mama didn't love us enough. And she left a great big chocolate sized hole in your heart. And until you can fix the marriage or find the love of your life, you're going to have to go right on eating chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. Mm -hmm. This voice of justification. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at that point, I started to think, I'm busy with this belief that if the emotions are the fire, I have to put out the fire, otherwise the house is going to burn down. Mm -hmm. But you can have a fire, a roaring fire in the living room in a well-contained fireplace. And that's an asset, not a liability. People mm -hmm. gather around, they laugh, they cry, they make memories, right? Um, it's only if there are holes in the fireplace that it becomes a problem. And so I said, maybe there's this voice inside of me, this voice of justification that's poking holes in the fireplace. So at that point, I start to put it all together. And I said, so there's this, there's maybe it's not the emotions, but the containment of the emotions that's really the important part. Maybe I have to sever the link between emotions and overeating. Um, maybe I have to be more of a take charge person here, like an alpha wolf that's being challenged for leadership. And when an alpha wolf is challenged for the leadership, it doesn't go, oh my goodness, someone needs a hug. It <laughs> growls and it snarls and it says, get back in line or I'll kill you, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so at this point, I did something a little crazy and it's also a little embarrassing for a sophisticated psychologist like me. Um, it's always hard for me to tell a story. I, don't, I filled it a hundred <laughs> times. I don't know why it's so hard for me. Um, I, I was not going to teach this. This is, this is a private thing. Um, I did not know that years later, I'd have 2 million readers that were <laughs> thinking about this. Um, I said, well, you know what, Glenn? I think you could say that this thing inside of you is like your inner pig. And you're going to have to figure out when your inner pig is active. So I made a rule a very crystal clear line in the sand that said, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. And that way, if I was in a Starbucks and I heard a voice that said, you worked out hard enough, Glenn, even though it's a Wednesday, you're not going to gain any weight. A little won't hurt. You can start your silly diet tomorrow. I say, whoa, wait a minute. That's not me. That's my inner pig squealing for pig slop. Chocolate on a Wednesday is pig slop. I don't need pig slop. I don't let fireman almost tell me what to do. Um, and as embarrassing as that is, and as crude and rude and primitive as it is, that's the thing that would wake me up at the moment of impulse and give me those extra microseconds to make a, a different choice. And um, it wasn't a miracle cure. I can't tell you that I suddenly got thin and never broke my rules. Or What did happen was it cleared away all the confusion. I no longer believed that there was some mysterious force inside of me. It's like all of a sudden it came into light what was actually happening. This was just a misfiring of my emergency response system. Feast and famine system, fight or flee. It's actually kind of part of the same apparatus in the body. Uh, it was just a misfiring. Those mm -hmm. people in industry had hijacked my survival drive mm -hmm. and I needed to figure out how to disempower that once once I woke up. So that woke me up to it. And mm. I made I made the right choice more often than I was. I was doing better. Mm. There were a whole bunch of things that I had to develop over time in order to really perfect that. One was that I needed to figure out how to turn off my body, how to turn off that emergency system. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of pieces and parts of that. One of them was feeding myself regularly, reliably, flooding myself with nutrition. I, I couldn't do these restrictive diets anymore. I couldn't do the extreme diets. I had to be mm -hmm. regular, reliable, day in, day out. As a matter of fact, I, I discovered that um, when I would have a chocolate craving, if I would make myself a kale banana smoothie, like kale juice and bananas, maybe some celery juice, that it wouldn't be as pleasurable as the chocolate would, 
Because I, I think chocolate kind of gets you high with food. It's got theobramine and fat and sugar and all, all this kind of stuff. Not that that's a horrible thing either all the time, but uh, for me it was. Um, but it would turn it off. So that was one thing was to nutrify my body. The other thing was to breathe. If mm-hmm. I would breathe in for a count of seven and out for a count of 11, I, I didn't conceptualize it like that until later, but that's what I was doing. I'd breathe in for, for less than I would breathe out because mm-hmm. it would take some time. And if I were being chased by a hungry bear, if there was a genuine emergency, I wouldn't have time to do that. I'd be going, <laughs> right? And so mm-hmm. if you very calmly breathe, it turns out you're shutting down the sympathetic nervous system, which is the emergency response system, mm-hmm. and you're activating the parasympathetic system, mm-hmm. which is the thing that says it's okay to rest and digest right. and strategize and pursue your long-term goals. Yeah. Um, so I would do that, and I'd do a couple of other things. I started carrying around something to write with. Um, this was right around the time that smartphones were coming in vogue. So I mostly use that, but sometimes a paper and pencil. And um, I would write down specifically what my pig was squealing about. I'd say, okay, pig, mm. why do you want me to break my rules? And it would say, mm. you know, well, you can just start your silly diet tomorrow. So I'd write that down. Mm. Writing is an upper brain activity. Mm. Binging is a lower brain activity, right? right. So... Cool. That made me feel calmer just in and of itself, just putting it in words. And I realized that it was saying more than I thought it was saying before I would write it down. Um, you know, you worked out hard enough, therefore you can just start your silly diet, diet tomorrow. Once I would write down the full squeal, I would say, okay, I'd take another couple of breaths, 7-Eleven breaths. And I'd say, what's wrong with what the pig is saying? How is that a lie? And I discovered that it would usually win with a half truth and a bigger lie. So the truth is, if I only had a half a bar and I worked out hard, I probably wouldn't gain weight. But the lie was that I was gonna have a lot more than a half a bar and that mm-hmm. there was probably gonna be followed by washing it down with a whole pizza. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And the bigger lie, even than that, was that if you have a craving and you have the thought, I'll just start my diet tomorrow, and then you indulge the craving, you've actually, neurologically reinforced the craving and you've mm-hmm. neurologically reinforced that thought. So your craving is going to be worse tomorrow as is your probability of saying, mm-hmm. I'll just start my silly diet tomorrow, tomorrow. Huge. So mm-hmm. you can only ever use the present moment to be healthy. If you're in a hole, stop digging. I call that process, that process, rational refutation mm-hmm. that, that you, um, examine the cancerous logic that your pig is using. You, you don't have to call it a pig, by the way. I know now you can call it um, your food demon or your inner junkyard your dog, but it's not your inner wounded child. It's, it's just this thing inside of you that you have to separate mm-hmm. from uh, and, and be mm-hmm. you know, dominant over. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I would do all of those things, um, I would find that the craving went away. When I took care of all those things, I'd experiment with different rules. I discovered that it was better to set a low bar, that it was more important to follow the rules than to lose weight right away. Um, I, I discovered that when I had a set of rules that I actually could follow, that my confidence really built and um, yeah. and that the confidence was more important than anything because it was like, like who's in charge? Is it me or the pig? Yeah. And the more that I felt like I was in charge, the more hope that I have. Because I mean, I was desperate. I, I really thought that there was no beating this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I figured my life was going to, I mean, my triglycerides were over a thousand. I thought I was going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and over the course of the next eight years, I kept a journal, all the things my pig said, all the reasons it was wrong. I was getting divorced in 2015, and as a um, outgrowth of some of my business contacts, I wound up as a minor partner in a publishing company. Mm -hmm. And the CEO calls me and says, we need to publish our own book. And I said, well, I'm in the middle of the divorce. It's not a bad time to write a book. Mm -hmm. Um, I said, I have this journal that I kept about me versus my inner pig. He goes, I love it. I love it. That's what we should write. So (laughs) I take the summer and I write the book. It's really just more like editing a journal into a book. Um, It's Mm -hmm. kind of like an allegory about me versus the pig. And um, before you know it, um, we publish the book and um, 
you know, we're, we both had spent a lifetime in marketing, so we kind of knew what to do, but we had no idea about the viral component mm-hmm. and how much it was going to take off. Mm-hmm. And it really took off. And um, people don't quite know my name when they see me, but they'll mm-hmm. come up to me at a bookstore and they'll go, pig guy, you're the pig guy. <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible story. I, I, I just, I love hearing how... <laughs> these so-called bad roads that we go down are so important if we will continue listening to ourselves, honor ourselves, working on ourselves. Because you had no intention when you were doing this journal, like, okay, someday I'm going to be working for a publishing right. company in public. You had no idea. Like, in working for big food and all of that was so necessary for you to get an understanding and like, even all the marketing background. It's, like, it's crazy. You have that on top of being a psychologist. It's just like, so wonder. I love hearing how, Oh. Thank, thank, thank you for saying that because I, I sometimes feel like no, it was so sad needed. about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some of my dark, you know, dark paths that I've been on, which was a lot very similar. You know, wounded, wounded sense of self, marriage failing. It didn't feel like my body was enough. Had to prove that it was enough. All of these just disordered patterns came in. I have no shame about any of that. I'm so grateful. I walked down that road and was able to find healing like you, because now I get to understand what that's actually like, because you learn the nuances, you know, that little Starbucks moment on the Wednesday with the chocolate, because you've lived through it. And it's like, that is real different than just just yeah. technically, you know, <laughs> knowing about something. Um, I'm really, really interested in this uh, alpha wolf versus it, it's so cool with it could because you have your psychology background. You're like, oh, it must be a lack of self-love and I'm going to go fully on that, you know, but and then also this rules like the, these two roads that you took and you realize like just the love piece wasn't enough. Um I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. For me, um, a lot of a similar energy of what you're describing with this alpha wolf, I call it mom love <laughs> oh. and I call it being my own mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, what I mean by that is one, I have this one thing. I realized that a lot of my binging behaviors came from, I was just freaking hungry because I'm trying to like starve myself in. Right. And so mm-hmm. it was just, Yes. I I started to tell myself, you can have that after you eat your real food. And then once I ate real food, then I wasn't quite so starving for 5 million goodies, you know, um, Mm -hmm. that helped me. So it was kind of interesting because it was what what, what a, what a simple, powerful message. I love that. Yeah. It was a very, it was a similar thing of that, a little bit strict, like, uh, you know, just like I'd be with my kids, I'm not going to let them eat like 500 bags of candy when they haven't had dinner. Like, it's just love. It, it is love, but it is like a strict kind of alpha. It brings in that alpha wolf thing. Um, and then also I love the the breathing thing is so big uh, for me. Um, I had gotten past like you, it's a, it's years long process. So if anyone's listening and you're dealing with overcoming this, like for me too, many years, you kind of get to a certain level and you're like, yeah, I got this. And then it's like, all of a sudden you're driving around the gas stations, getting donuts. And you're like, Oh, guess I didn't get past that. What's going on, you know? And for me breathing, um, and I didn't journal, but I would talk out loud to myself. So when you talk about voices, you're in good company. Cause I actually use this all the time, all the time on myself. I'm like, so what's actually going on? on. And then I make myself answer and it is so powerful, you know? And so I even did a bikini competition as an experiment as a coach in 2021, which was horrible. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, it is literally starving yourself. I, I kept yeah. joking that I had entered a starvation contest who can starve the best. That's what it felt like, you know? And so that reptilian brain you're talking about, um, they've shown in research that bodybuilders will have a 50% increase in ghrelin, their hunger hormone when they're prepping for a show mm-hmm. that, I mean, that is like reptilian, like all the way, every sensor. I, I, like, I work with bodybuilders sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, oh my gosh, that threw me back into stuff that I hadn't experienced in so long. And the way I got out of it was, I just, you know, I'm just kind of supporting everything you're saying, because there was one day I was just like, I'm so done. I was eating 1300 calories a day. I probably normally am definitely over 2000, right? So day in and day out of 1300 calories while training like super high intense level. I mean, I was just starving. And one day I was just like, you know what? F it, right? You get that those F it moments. And I, I got in my car. I was like, I'm getting everything there freaking is. I'm getting pizza. <laughs> I'm getting cinnamon rolls. I'm getting chocolate. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. candy. I'm getting like, anything I can think of. It's all coming right now. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, I was in that mode. And I actually pulled off 
Cause I was like, dude, I am very, very triggered right now. Like I'm not in a good way. And I pulled off. I actually parked in my gym parking lot, which was, it just happened to be right there. And I started breathing really deep and I just started talking to myself and I started asking myself like, okay, let's pretend that you're eating the pizza right now. Go ahead. I like literally pretended that I had just eaten all the pizza. I was like, okay, pretend that you just ate all the cinnamon rolls and cookies and whatever else. Okay. I'm eating. I was like, how do you feel now? And I'm breathing those long, slow breaths the whole time. Cause I, we know enough to know if you can get yourself to calm down the physiology mm-hmm. will help. And I was able to get to a, a place of peace this the same way. So it was very similar. I didn't journal, but I, talking to myself, activating, as you say, like the higher parts of your brain and breathing those two things together, extremely powerful. were able to help me get past that. Now I did binge like crazy after the competition and I have a whole podcast about that. And it was real eye opening. What can happen when you get yourself to those levels of starvation and deprivation, you know? And so yeah. I, I also love that you're hitting feed yourself nourishing foods, right? Cause that was the problem. I was just malnourished. I was just, if you, if you want to lose weight, <laughs> flood, flood your body with nutrition at a slight caloric deficit. Beautiful. That, that's Beautiful. That, that's the, the mantra. Yeah. And the deficit is so easy when you're so much easier when you're eating real food from nature. Cause yes. stuffing yourself on meat, potatoes, and veggies is like guaranteed going to be fewer calories and stuffing yourself on ice cream and candy That's true. and, you know, empty things like that. Okay. So in terms of my question, in terms of like the self-love thing, like I've worked with people who have these kind of patterns that you're talking about, like it's just, their mind is controlled by food and it turns into sort of like an exercise bulimia like situation where they're just trying to exercise it all off. And it's just this vicious cycle. Um, often I found with those people, there's generally like an abusive parent is what I've come across. And I I know you've worked with so many, so I'm just curious, like, do you feel like there's a place for the, the self-love part and the alpha wolf? Like, how do you balance that with people? So, so the thing that lit the fire is not necessarily what keeps the fire going. Um, Mm -hmm. and if your house is burning down, you want to be a fireman more so than an arson investigator. Yeah. So you want to do the things that put out the fire first. I love that. That said, when you put out the fire, what you're left with is yourself. And so there's more than enough room to talk about that. Mm. The, the, um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm still a psychologist and I'm fascinated by the relationship about what, what got this all started. And yeah. Um, I hurt for the traumas that people have been through and I, I'm, I'm still a healer inside. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that the danger is in thinking that you need to solve the emotional difficulties before you stop overeating because yeah. not only will that go on forever, but it also will prevent you from looking at the emotional difficulties square in the face because the overeating stops you from getting to those thoughts and feelings. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather implement the very practical wow. steps to get yeah. you to stop overeating. Okay. May I say a couple of things more about that? Yes, please. I, I, I know we could be short on time. I, no, no, okay. you're fine. Okay. Um, most people misunderstand the relationship between emotional stimulation and overeating. Um, it's true that the nervous system has difficulty conducting the emotions when the digestive system is overloaded. And so overeating has an anesthetic effect on the emotion. And that's why people will say, well, I just wanted to numb out. This was too upsetting for me. I just wanted to numb out. Mm-hmm. Um, because that their, that's their experience is that they don't feel the emotion as much after they right. overeat. Right. But I tell them there's a lot more going on than just the numbing. Um, sometimes I'll make a joke and I'll say, hey, when you go to the dentist, does he ever say, I'm sorry, I'm out of Novocaine. Could I inject you with a bagel? Um, it, it just, you know, it tells you there's something else that's going on with the bagel, mm-hmm. um, chocolate bagels, you know, bags, pop tarts, mm-hmm. they're unnatural concentrations of starch and sugar and all the things we mm-hmm. talked about. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't find them in nature. We didn't have right. these bags in, on the, on the Savannah. So mm-hmm. when we're going to those binges, we're not only just numbing out, we're actually looking for a high, we're getting high with food. 
So I tell people that if you start thinking about that, it'll become a little more dystonic and harder to, yeah. to go to the food because numbing out sounds like, oh, I just needed to comfort myself. I mean, her inner child right. needs a hug and everything. Um, okay. But even beyond that, there's actually a two-way relationship between emotional stimulation and overeating. So let's take someone who feels very anxious and feels like they need to eat before they go to bed. They have mm -hmm. to have usually a whole bunch of carbs so they feel like they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, anxiety has a bunch of physical manifestations. Our heartbeat goes up, our blood pressure is up a little bit, our gal galvanic skin response is up, our respiration, our perspiration. These are very measurable. Mm -hmm. There are animal studies where they take those measures and then when those measures are raised, they give the animal a sugar reward or a carbohydrate reward, right? And what they'll find is that those measures go down a little bit when they get the reward. However, as a whole, over the course of the month, those measures are elevated for the animals that were rewarded for having those measures elevated. What we think that means, we can't ask the animals if they're anxious, but what we think that means is that we've reinforced the anxiety unwittingly by eating the sugar or the starch. So you might think that you're helping yourself with the anxiety by having the sugar, but you might actually be perpetuating it and making it worse. Mm -hmm. And it might be, and I, I find this as a practical basis. I don't have a double blind clinical trial to prove this, but we have worked with 2000 people. And, and as a practical matter, I find that when people demonstrate this pattern, I'll say, look, you're gonna have trouble sleeping for three or four days. Uh, are you willing to go through that if it might mean that you get rid of it the rest of your life? More often than not, 70% of the time, I will find that um, people's anxiety gets much less when they stop rewarding it with sugar and carbohydrates. So mm -hmm. it's not just emotion to binge, it's binge to emotion, right? So it's it goes in both directions. One thing I'll add to this from a nutrition standpoint, because I got super curious about this, is that um, when you eat when you eat carbohydrates, when, especially like something that will be really quick acting, like sugary stuff, that does blunt adrenaline, right? So if you have a bunch of adrenaline going on because you're really anxious, it will blunt that down. But I was like, okay, but what is actually going on? We know that sugar exacerbates anxiety. So like, what is actually going on? And what I found that is that high concentrations of fructose, so not fruit, those are actually really pretty low in fructose compared to high fructose corn syrup and white sugar. Right. It doesn't have the so guar in the pectin. Yeah. Super crazy concentrated amount of fructose blunts the, the release of the enzyme that turns glutamate into GABA. So glutamate are excitatory neurotransmitter that makes your mind just race and you can't stop and blah, blah, blah. To GABA is the cool, calm, collected. Fructose in high concentrations blocks that enzyme that converts the glutamate into GABA. And I think that's why people, yes, in the immediate, are you going to feel a little bit of a drop in the current adrenaline? Yeah. But in your gut, you just block the release of the enzyme that's going to help you be cool, calm, and collected for the next day or two. So interesting. that's how I see that yo-yo happen. And it's like, it, it makes sense what you're saying that if they just will stop, it will go down over time because they just fed anxiety for the next day. They got an immediate relief and they just set themselves up for failure for at least the next day. So, yeah. Do, do you do consulting? Can I send some people to you about that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we can talk offline. Oh, okay. Okay. But so yeah, that, that's, so, that's really good to know. Yes. I was yeah. like that. I get it now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So keep continue on with your well, that, that, that's mostly what I wanted to say okay. is, is that okay. it's a, it's a two year relationship. You are not just numbing out, you're getting high with food. Yeah. Um, and that if you don't do something very practical to stop the overeating, you're never going to solve these problems because the physiology overtakes the articulation of the problems right. in, in words. And words are the mechanism of cure in psychotherapy, mm -hmm. more or less. They're, they're the food of the intellect. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you articulate your traumas and experience in words, you can bring to bear the totality of your adult intellect and, and experience. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it just kind of sits there in this very, yeah. very diffuse, emotional, vague. Um, and once it gets hard, or, you stop. <laughs> yeah. That's what I've learned. When, once you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no more um, things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love what you said about the, the fireman and the arson investigator. When you're in the heat of the moment, you need the fireman. Yes. 
you know, yep. and I, I love that. It's like, and that, that's what really helped me was like having phrases, like you said, words, like things rule, like, it's like, you know, I, in the heat of all of my bingey type stuff, it had to start with, you will live until tomorrow. Don't think just do just go to bed. Just that's yep. it. I just had to have yep. that very straight. Like, we're not going there. We're not going to be in this. Well, maybe it's like, <laughs> hell, you yeah. know, anyone who's been through that. Well, knows well that. And, and when you clarity and focus helps a lot also. Yeah. Because when you have a crystal clear bullseye, I'll never have chocolate on a weekday again, as yeah. opposed to I'll try to avoid. I'll, most people will say, well, I'll just avoid chocolate 90% of the time and I'll indulge yeah. 10% of the time. Right. Yeah. It's a nightmare. <laughs> hey, 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 well, do you know why? Do you know why it's an nightmare? No, yeah, no. Because you don't know which is the 90% and which is the 10%. Right. So you have to make a chocolate decision every time you're in front of an opportunity, <laughs> right? Right. And that, right. Wears, that wears down your willpower. Oh, 100%. Clarity, you know, and even in like the goal setting with my clients, it's like, well, what do you want? I want to be healthier. I'm like, that's so stressful. That is so stressful. What does that mean? Healthier, you know, having some sense of clarity. It's like, I want to go to bed at nine o'clock. Okay. Now we're talking now we're talking. <laughs> so yeah, we need clarity because otherwise I, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like it becomes a stressor. It's like, I gotta be healthier. I gotta sometimes eat good. It's just uh, the lack of clarity. And, and makes then, it and, so hard. And then, so, so you've not only made your decisions when you have clarity, but yeah. then you can hear when yeah. something is suggesting that you aim for something else. Right. right. And then, you know, you have to go into action to fix that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, Glenn, Glenn. Yeah. I, I have to say, like, I really appreciate your honesty and transparency, the vulnerability that you're sharing. I know sometimes going through the ropes of those things, it's like, oh, am I really going to talk about the inner pig thing? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to tell them that's what I did really appreciate that. Appreciate the life journey that you've been on. Appreciate you taking the time in the middle of your divorce to write a book and, and also all the skills on marketing and everything else you learned to be able to get this out here, because I can tell you from the work I'm doing every day, it is unbelievably needed at this point in time and humanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. And thank you. am I correct in reading that your book is free? Um, it, we offer it for free on the website in PDF format. You can get all the traditional formats for a small charge if you want to. Okay. Um, but if, if you go to neverbingeagain.com and click the big red button, you'll get a free copy of your book in PDF. You get links to all the other formats. You will also get a free set of uh, starter templates. So we're, we're diet agnostic. I, I don't really get involved with the mm. dietary arguments. I will tell yeah. you the more more extreme diets don't do as well with this approach than mm -hmm. um, if you're just going to try to get away from processed stuff. But um, otherwise, mm -hmm. where it doesn't matter if you're low carb, high carb, um, you know, vegetarian, yeah. carnivore, yeah. it doesn't matter. Um, and we develop a bunch of food plan starter templates so you can see how people mm. use these kinds of rules in their own Very particular cool. life. And I recorded a set of coaching sessions so you can hear, it's all free, you can hear what it's like to go from, um, you know, feeling in despair and desperate and hopeless about it, to feeling optimistic and hopeful and and um, enthusiastic in just one session. So neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.